There is an actress by the name of Helen Mirren, and I read a quote from her recently. The quote is this, before you argue with someone, ask yourself, is that person mentally mature enough to grasp the concept of a different perspective? Because if they are not, there is absolutely no point in engaging them. Now, I have to confess that I didn't even know who Helen Mirren was, so I thought, well, that's an interesting quote. I should find out who this person is. Subsequently, I learned that she was a well-regarded actress. But here's something I found interesting. In a 1990 interview, Mirren said that she was an atheist. And in the August 2011 issue of Esquire magazine, she said, I am quite spiritual. I believed in fairies when I was a child. I still do sort of believe in fairies. Oh, and the leprechauns too. But I don't believe in God. End of quote. Well, I do agree with Helen that it is pointless to argue with someone not mentally mature enough to grasp the concept of a different perspective. I don't believe that because Helen said it. I believe that because the book of Proverbs cautions more than once to not argue with a fool. To be an atheist, one must believe that out of nothing, everything comes. And that out of the random comes precision. And that out of the chaos comes order. Someone said, I could never be an atheist because I simply don't have that much faith. There is a Latin phrase, some of you may have heard it, it's a truism, a self-evident truth. It's um, ex nihilo nihil fit. Out of nothing, nothing comes. In other words, nothing produces nothing. There must be something for something to be produced. And God is that something. God is that spark. And God created all that is. Now let's turn to the book of Romans this morning. And first of all, uh, go to Romans chapter 1. And in verse 16, I want you to notice that it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Some translations are from faith to faith. One translation puts it beginning and ending in faith. It begins and it ends in faith. As it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Heavenly Father, I thank you once again, as always, for the power of your Holy Spirit present in our hearts and present in our minds and present in this room to open the eyes of our understanding and let the light shine in so that we might comprehend with all the saints your revealed truth. And we thank you today and we praise you today and we honor you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, amen and amen. Somebody once asked me this question, did people ever truly live by faith? I didn't quite understand where they were going. And they said, well, I mean, do you believe that men like Abraham and Moses lived by faith? And I said, well, I believe it because the Bible says that they did. The Bible says that by faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And the Bible says that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And the Bible says, we're, we're in the book of Hebrews 11. This is the fifth and sixth verse. The Bible says, Enoch was translated. He was changed from one position to another, translated. And he was not found because God translated him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, the writer of Hebrews then says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So if the question is, do people ever truly live by faith, then the answer would be, yes, they do. And furthermore, people alive today must also live by faith. So how's your faith? How's your faith? The just shall live by faith. And of course, you'll remember Hebrews 11, one through three, it says, now faith is the substance of the things that we hope for. It's the evidence of the things we don't see. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. And through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of the things that do appear. And then in chapter 12, verses one through three, it says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Jesus endured, we too can endure. And when it feels like you can't go on, when your faith is stretched thin, and you're having a difficult time trusting God. The Bible says, consider Jesus. Consider what he endured. He was our substitute. He was our atonement. His righteousness would be imputed to us in the great exchange. God would take away our sin and put it upon the righteous one and exchange that righteousness for our unrighteousness. Four times in the Bible, God says the just shall live by faith. We might ask the question, well then who are the just? Because that's important, to, you know, if the just are you going to live by faith? Who are the just? In Romans 5, 1, it says, therefore being justified by faith. So the just are the justified, those who have been justified by faith. The verse goes on and says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the just are those who have been justified by faith. If we're saved, there's only one way for us to live, and that's by faith. I believe you know this, but it always bears repeating because when some people hear that terminology, they sometimes scratch their head inside and think, what do you mean live by faith? Live by religion? Live by piety? What are you talking about? And that's why I will often use the word trust because faith is trust. Anytime you find yourself keyed up and anxious, Stop and ask yourself, is, is that what trust would be doing? You know, I, if I trust God, would I be this worried? Would I be this anxious? I'm not saying that we don't get upset when things don't go well. When we get a bad diagnosis from the doctor or when somebody dies and it breaks our heart. But our response to these situations must be one that is characteristic of the just. The just live by their trust in God. Remember that in all things, we are to live by faith, to live by trust in God. In the Old Covenant Proverbs, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean upon 
your understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him, and then he will direct your paths. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'll believe it when I see it? I have. You'll tell them something that's unbelievable, to use a colloquialism, because people will say that too. Well, that's just unbelievable. But once in a while, you'll hear them say, well, I'll believe that when I see it. Hell will freeze over before that happens. And sadly, in this most cynical, most pessimistic, most skeptical, sarcastic, distrustful, suspicious, contemptuous, disparaging of times, did I cover it all? That's how the average person lives, by sight, not by faith. You cannot live by sight and by faith at the same time. Neither can you live by fear and by faith at the same time. It either has to be faith or fear. It has to be faith or it has to be sight. So which one are you living? Faith helps remove the anxiety. Faith helps remove the fear. Faith leans on the Lord. It knows that the Bible is true. It knows that the Bible can be trusted. And it knows that we can live by its principles and by its precepts. The Bible inspires us so that we're able to put our faith in God and trust Him with everything. And that would be to supply our needs, to answer the questions that so often invade our minds, and to accept that there are times, hear me now, where there just are no answers. Because there are questions without answers, at least for now. This is a temporary existence. This is a sojourn. But when we step through the veil, we will know even as we are known. We will know. I was speaking in a church in New York recently, and I said to the folks there that some of you have this laundry list of questions, and you somehow think you're going to die, and then you're going to open your eyes, and you're just going to charge down Main Street, those golden streets, and say, I need to talk to God. I want to know why all these things happened and why all these other things didn't happen. I said, I hate to break your little bubble there, you know, burst your balloon, but um, you'll do no such thing because you'll just know even as you are known. Now, some say uh, that living by faith is not practical. And I agree that common sense has its place in our lives, but sometimes our senses only report to our minds how hopeless things are at the moment. Our senses, all the data coming in from all of our sensory banks are telling our mind it's hopeless, it's failure, it's not going to work. But faith says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, his blood and his righteousness. Somebody said, well, I'm living by faith, but I'm having a hard time in life. I don't mean to be callous, insensitive, but uh, so what? So what? God never promises an easy life. This easy life of prosperity and blessing and walking in divine health, never having as much as a sniffle if you just have enough faith in God and trust in God, is a false doctrine that has shipwrecked the faith of multiplied millions of so-called believers around the world because it gives them this false hope, this false impression that all I have to do is get saved and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and study the Bible enough and nothing can go wrong. My life is going to be full of money and it's going to be full of health and happiness. And, uh, and uh, let me tell you what, um, there are so many little boats that have run aground by believing that false doctrine that preachers who get it 
and who understand the truth are overworked, running rescue missions to save the shipwrecked who have believed the lie. Now, I'm not saying that you should not pray and ask God for healing in your body if you are battling an illness, because God in His mercy and His grace can heal you. I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask God to bless your finances. Follow the principles of God's Word for sure. There are principles involved. Follow the rules, and you may indeed receive manifold blessings from the Lord. So what I'm not saying is that we shouldn't pray for these things. What I am saying is we should not see a sickness or going through a hard time financially or emotionally, having a period in life where you're on the rocks is some sign, some symbol, some message that you're not walking with God, that you're not right with God. God never promised the rose garden. He promised that he would always be there to help you no matter what life throws your way. And that in his sovereignty, it's all part of the plan. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's Proverbs 3, 6. In Psalm 37, 5, he said, commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. You know, I remember hearing a pastor at a minister's conference many, many years ago tell a story about the day that he was praying for the financial needs of his church. He was in his study. He was kneeling at this little table with his eyes closed. And he said, when I got through praying, I opened my eyes and there were four $100 bills lying right there on the table where I was praying. And somebody asked him, well, do you think that God materialized the money? Do you think it fell, you know, from the sky? He said, no. He said, I think somebody came in and dropped it on the table while I was deep in prayer and I just didn't see them. His point was, who cares how the prayer is answered? Who cares as long as the answer comes. The trouble with so many of us is that we're not willing to put that absolute trust in Him. The only thing that honors God is when we trust. And the only thing God honors is trust. He honors our faith. And I'm so glad that I'm learning how to trust Him more and more every day. Are you learning to live by faith? The greatest example of faith in the Bible, some may say, well, it must be Moses, right? Or Abraham, Abraham, well, look at Paul. Look at Stephen, they stoned him. No, the greatest example of faith in the Bible is the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine leaving heaven and coming down to be born into the arms of a peasant mother in a dirty stable? Can you imagine walking into the jaws of death, having a crown of thorns pushed into your brow, nails driven through your wrists, having your side pierced by a lance? Can you imagine being rejected by the world you made? Simon Peter denied him, Judas betrayed him, many went back and walked with him no more, and yet when he hung on that executioner's cross to die for the sin of his elect, he said these words, Father, forgive them, they are clueless. Well, that's my translation. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Well, isn't that cluelessness? Father, Forgive them. And to wrap it all up, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. I mean, that is absolute trust, Luke 23, 46. And so I'll ask you again, and then we'll pray. How's your faith? How's your faith? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word as always because we know that in knowing the truth, we can experience 
genuine freedom and genuine life. And without faith, we know we cannot please you. Faith comes by hearing the word. Our faith grows stronger when we feed our spirit on your holy word. Thank you for these things. And as always, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. amen.